Isaiah 12, 2 says, Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. Today we're going to sing a new song, and I just want us to let it soak in that we serve a God who defends us, who is for us, and that in the times in your life, maybe even today when you've 
feel like you are alone. We serve a God who is with us, who never leaves us, who never forsakes us.
seated to hear this hell of communion and that we honor our God and King who gave his all for us. Today we're going to talk about grapes. Grapes, grapes, grapes. I've even brought some grapes and they were pretty well attached yesterday and they're dropping everywhere today. They're sweet grapes because I ate several of them. There's one sitting here underneath my shoe right now. I won't eat that one just yet. <laughs> Today we're going to find out how to produce. How to produce. Produce a little or produce a lot or produce none at all. Do you know that's in the Bible? Today we find the secret to abundance. If you believe it. Today we're going to find our place in God's marvelous garden. It's interesting to me that it all started in a garden, not accidental. And you and I are going to find our place in God's marvelous garden. Have you noticed, because I have, the number of vineyards that are popping up in Kentucky? It's interesting to me. We didn't have any vineyards in Kentucky when I grew up. They were all tobacco patches. Our soil, our climate in Kentucky seems to be good for growing grapes. Israel was a good place to grow grapes too. In fact, the Bible talks a lot about vineyards and grapes and wine. And I mean, when I say a lot, I mean a lot. It's everywhere. One of the first things that Noah did after the flood was what? Genesis 9 Verse 20, after the flood, Noah began to cultivate the ground and he planted a vineyard. God told the people of Israel that obedience would produce something. After the flood, God calls Abraham and he calls a group of people and he sets this world standard that he alone can set. And he said this, that obedience, if you'll just do what I tell you, I'll do something in response to to that obedience what would that thing that God did in response look like he says I'll if you'll obey me I'll make the land produce good grapes by producing good vineyards God said I'll do this for you now some of you might think well that seems like an unusual response from God not when you look at grapes like he looks at grapes Agriculture was linked to blessings because they were an agricultural society. They didn't run down to Kroger and pick something up. Leviticus 26. If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you the seasonal rains. The land will then yield its crops and the trees of the field will produce their fruit. Your threshing season will overlap with grape harvest, and your grape harvest will overlap with the season of planting grain. You will eat your fill and live securely in your own land. What was that blessing linked to, if you'll just do what I tell you? Obedience produced beautiful vineyards. Are you with me? Obedience. God set it up. Man didn't set this up. God said obedience will produce beautiful vineyards. God even made laws about eating grapes in other people's vineyards. You know that? Deuteronomy 23. When you enter your neighbor's vineyard, you may eat your fill of grapes, but you must not carry any away in a basket. That's cheating. Grapes and vineyards are all over the Bible, and they're part of the blessing of God. 
the fruitful life for the children of God. I'm convinced reading the Bible that God likes grapes. Because they're everywhere. But what the Lord gives, the Lord can take away. In Deuteronomy 28, this is what disobedience looks like. You will plant vineyards and care for them, but you will not drink, drink the wine or eat the grapes, for the worms will destroy the vines. Obedience to God brought forth a great harvest of grapes. It's His way. God's got a way. Obedience to God brought forth a great harvest of grapes and vineyards. But disobedience seems to work in the reverse order. The crops will fail and you'll watch someone else gather and eat your grapes. God even uses a vineyard to describe His children. I'm convinced He's really into grapes. He even uses a vineyard to describe His children. Do you know that? And God expected, let, let me say it this way, God himself planted and cultivated a vineyard called Israel. Nobody else planted this vineyard and cultivated this vineyard to produce some grapes. He did. And God expected sweet grapes from these vines called children. God wanted lots and lots of sweet grapes from the garden that he planted in Israel. Did he get it? Isaiah 57. Now I will sing for the one I love a song about his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a rich and fertile hill. He plowed the land, cleared its stones, and planted it with the best vines. In the middle, he built a watchtower and carved a wine press in the nearby rocks. Then he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes. Who, who's he? Who planted it? God planted it. And he waited for a harvest of sweet grapes. God planted the vineyard in Israel, and he had expectations of sweet grapes coming out of the vineyard, right? But the grapes that grew were bitter. Now, you people of Jerusalem and Judah, you judge between me and my vineyard, God says. What more could I have done for my vineyard that I have not already done? When I expected sweet grapes, why did my vineyard give me bitter grapes? Now, let me tell you what I will do to my vineyard. I will tear it down. I will tear down its hedges and let it be destroyed. I will break down its walls and let the animals trample it. I will make it a wild place where the vines are not pruned and the ground is not hoed. The place overgrown with briars and thorns. I will command the clouds to drop no rain on it. And just in case you're sitting in the room right now and you, you're really not getting the connection, listen to this next sentence. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. The nation of Israel is the vineyard planted by God of the Lord of heaven's armies. The people of Judah are his pleasant garden. He expected a crop of justice, but instead he found depression. He expected to find righteousness, but instead he heard cries of violence. That was from the prophet Isaiah. You know when it was written? More than 700 years before the birth of Christ. God wanted sweet grapes from His vineyard called Israel, but He got sour, bitter, bad grapes. So over the next 300 years from the time of Isaiah, God did what God said He was going to do. From the time of Isaiah, over the next 300 years, He tore down the vineyard of Israel. He tore it down. He built it up and he tore it down. Israel was destroyed and the Jewish people were scattered to foreign lands. 
The prophet Malachi comes with a word of hope to the remnant of Israel. And then 400 years of silence. If you become a student of the Old Testament, you start to see something develop. For over 300 years, he just tears down the vineyard. And then that Malachi comes, and Malachi has one word to Israel in its shattered vineyard. There's hope for the future. And then something happens. Listen, there's 400 years of biblical silence. Not a word. Not a word. No prophets. No word from God. No word about vineyards. No word about grapes. No word about anything. And then He comes. Somebody say hallelujah. And then He comes. And then 400 years of biblical silence. 400 years. And the northern kingdom of Israel has been the vineyards torn down. And the southern kingdom, the vineyards torn down. And 400 years of absence of the vineyard planting God. And then He comes. Jesus comes and guess what? <laughs> guess what? Jesus talks about a vineyard. Coincidence? A garden. He talks about a vineyard, a garden where God again would desire sweet grapes. Are you interested in finding out about God's garden? Are you interested today to find out about God's presence and how God desires grapes? Some 700 years after the first grapevine. Listen, the Bible gives the dates. We can, we can date this. Some 700 years after the first grapevine called Israel, the northern kingdom was torn down. Some 600 years after the second grapevine was torn down, the southern kingdom called Judah a new grapevine. A new grapevine. He, he's torn down the first one. And he tore down the second one. And then there's silence. And then a new grapevine is planted by God in Israel. A new one. Did you know that? God plants a new grapevine, and this grapevine, are you ready? This grapevine speaks. He speaks. This grapevine is guaranteed, 100% guaranteed, to produce sweet grapes for God the Father, God the gardener. This grapevine is unlike the one that was planted in Israel. This grapevine is perfect, and it always produces sweet grapes. Who planted this grapevine? A gardener. Who's the gardener? God the Father. Who's the grapevine? Jesus the Son. And He speaks. Did you know that? Today we open John 15. I think it's session 29 in the Gospel of John. Here we go. Jesus says, I am the true grapevine. And my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And He prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they'll produce even more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Now I want you to notice something about grapes. Right now, I'm holding grapes and I'm holding branches. And I can tell you by looking, the grapes are barely hanging on to those branches. If I jiggle, they're going to fall off. But I do not hold in front of you a vine. I'm holding branches. Okay? I want you to see that before we get into the story today. You've got to understand something about this agricultural phenomena. These are branches. The vine, it's, these branches have been cut from the vine. And the branches hold the grapes. And the grapes are sweet. They're good grapes. A branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot produce fruit if you are severed from the vine. 
the true grapevine. This phrase, Jesus comes in John 15 and he says, I am the true grapevine. Now, I went to every translation of English I could find, and every one of them used the same word, true. True. Now, that would make me think that there's a false one. But this is the true grapevine. This phrase is singular in nature and absolute in truth. There will, there will be false grapevines, but they will not produce sweet grapes for the Father. The Father is the gardener, and He is the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the Father of Jesus. And let me start the story by telling you, He and He alone plants this vineyard. In the previous chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus said this. I want you to compare the two. John 14, 6. Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth and the life. And no one can come to the Father except through me. You know what? If I take John 14 and John 15 and put them together, here's what I hear. I am the true grapevine. I am the way to God. I am the true grapevine. I am the truth about God. I am the true grapevine. I am the life of God to be traded for the life of mankind. I am the true grapevine. I will be the only producer of sweet grapes for my Father's kingdom. Listen carefully. There is no other way to make a grape pleasing to the Father except from this singular grapevine. That's the good news. But I'd be wrong not to read verse 2, the bad news. The bad news from the gardener, verse 2, chapter 15. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. Did you hear me, church? He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so that they'll produce even more fruit. Now, I'm going to ask you a crazy question. Do you think he's bluffing? How many people in the church think he's bluffing? Oh, you wouldn't really cut off a branch. Is this just a Jesus motivational metaphor, this whole vine and branch thing and cutting and pruning? Did you read about the vineyard that was planted in the north? Church. Do you think he's bluffing? Did you read about the vineyard that he planted, the gardener planted in the north? Did he cut it down? Did you read about the vineyard he planted in the north? Israel and then Judah. He cut them both down? Uh, but he won't do that anymore. Those kingdoms of Israel didn't produce sweet grapes. Nobody here is going to be able to say you didn't know. You see, the kingdoms of Israel didn't produce sweet grapes for the gardener in those kingdoms, those vineyards planted by God. Planted by God. Listen, they didn't plant themselves. Planted by God with the expectation to produce sweet grapes for the gardener. He tore them down. Some 2,000 years ago from today, the gardener planted a new grapevine in Israel. Please don't miss this. Looking back in history of the world, 2,000 years ago for us today, the, the gardener, God the Father, planted a new perfect grapevine in Israel. This new grapevine is absolutely pure and perfect. Every grape from this grapevine will be sweet and acceptable to the Father. Every one of them. This grapevine will produce grapes, many grapes, many sweet grapes for the Father. The gardener, the Father, will cut off any branches that are not producing sweet grapes. You, nobody's going to be able to say, well, I didn't know that was the condition. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. It's written. Some people just don't believe it. The gardener will prune the branches that are making sweet grapes. And you know what? 
I don't like pruning. Can I just say it out loud? It hurts. But the love of the Father prunes those that are attached to his great man. Why? So that he can cause your life trouble? No, so that you will become more and 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 more sweet grapes. He wants some sweet grapes. Stop for a moment here and ask a question. Who's Jesus talking to in John 15? Now you might say he's talking to me, and he is he's talking to us, but in that scene, who's he talking to? Jesus is talking to his disciples. If you weren't a disciple of Jesus and he starts calling himself a grapevine, you'll probably leave the room because you won't understand it. But to his disciples, they understood it. He's talking to his disciples, his followers, those who have connected themselves to him, those who have attached their lives to this man. They get it. They understand. He's a grapevine, I'm a branch, and I, the branch, am holding on to that vine. Are you a branch today of Jesus, the great man? I'm going to ask you, are you a branch today that is connected to this true great man named Jesus? Are you sure? Now, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm not just trying to make you wiggle in your seat. Are you sure? Can you know? Can I read John 15 and know? Yeah, you can. You can. How can you tell for sure that you're connected to the true grapevine? Well, let me ask you a silly question. Are you producing any grapes? Well, that's kind of personal. Are you producing any grapes? Any sweet grapes? Any grapes pleasing to the gardener? Grapes don't come off the vine. Did you hear me? I thought about this quite a bit. And I concluded, grapes don't come off the vine. Are you listening? Grapes come off branches. They come off the branches. They don't come off the vine. They come off the branches. God set a way to do things. He set a way to do things. Man didn't set this way. God set this way. And sweet grapes don't come off of the vine. Sweet grapes come off of the branches. So I'm going to ask you again. You bunch of branches. I'm in there too. Do you see any sweet grapes? Grapes come from the vine. Are you with me? They come from the vine, but they appear on the branches. They come from the vine. Life flows from the vine into and through the branches and produce sweet grapes. They appear on the branches, not the vine. Let me ask you again, are you a branch that is connected to and abiding in the true grapevine? Yes or no? Yes or no? You see, it's a yes or no question. And if you're in the room today and you say, I don't know, then just say no. Just say no. Be honest with yourself. Say no. I'm not connected. What did that branch connection to the true grapevine do to the branches and how? Don't miss this. Because here's where we're going. What, it, what, what happens when a branch connects to this vine? What happens? Verse 3. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Pruned and purified. Pruned and purified. Let's start with pruned. Pruned is a cutting away of that which is unnecessary for the growth of good grapes. Church, we need some pruning. That which is unnecessary for the production of good grapes. Let, let me rephrase it. Distractions. Compare that statement of Jesus to the beginning of the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 12, excuse me, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge 
crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, which means heaven's watching. God's watching. The angels are watching. Since we are surrounded, let me tell you what, the people you work with are watching. Since we're surrounded by watchers, what should we do? Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. What's the race? This gardener is looking for some sweet grapes. Is your life producing sweet grapes for the gardener? Yes or no? Let me tell you this. I'm going to give you a physical and spiritual truth today. There is nothing wrong with this grape man. If you are unable to produce any sweet grapes while being connected while you think or think you're not connected to this grapevine, I'm going to tell you, you will never be able to look at that grapevine and say, you messed up. You're never going to be able to look at the grapevine and think, there's something wrong with the grapevine, and that's why I'm not making any grapes. This grapevine's perfect. Let me tell you this. Absolutely perfect. Let, let, me, let me get focused on the issue of the grape production. Do you need to throw away anything in your life? Do you need to get rid of anything in your life? Are there things in your life that are turned on that ought to be turned off? Are there any distractions in your life that keep you from connecting yourself to this vine? Hebrews calls it a race of endurance to produce sweet grapes. Is there any sin that keeps tripping you up and weighing you down? Church, let's get real, okay? I believe the return of Christ is near. So it's a good time to get real. Is there any sin in your life that's tripping you up and you just will not cut it off? You just will not repent of that sin you just will not cut that thing loose because it's dragging you down but you won't you won't turn it loose listen very carefully to this statement because i don't want to be misquoted today we are not saved by producing sweet grapes you will never hear me say that because that'd be a lie we are not saved by producing sweet grapes we produce sweet grapes because we are saved. There's a total difference between the two. We produce sweet grapes because we are saved and because we are connected to the true grapevine and we have been pruned and it was painful and I didn't like it then and I won't like it if it happens tomorrow. But I know it's God's way to produce His result. We have been pruned and we have been purified by God. That's the only way you make sweet grapes. What do you mean purified? You can't get sweet grapes from an unpurified branch. Do you hear me? There's nothing wrong with the vine. Church, there's nothing wrong with the vine. The vine is perfect. God, 2,000 years ago, planted a perfect vine in Israel. And anyone who connects themselves to that vine will produce sweet grapes. But that, that, that branch, that branch, which is us, connected to that vine, that branch has to be purified. It has to be purified to produce sweet grapes. Our purification comes through our connection with the perfect Grapevine. How do you do that? Now, here comes practical application for today. Okay, preacher, you got my attention. The, the branch must be purified and pruned. So how do I purify the branch? Through the message I have given you. It's in there. It's in there. Let me repeat verse 3. You have already been pruned and purified. How? How? How did I get pruned? How did I get purified? By the message. By the message I have given you. The Word of God. The Word of God purifies. 
And guess what? I've just read it to you. What's it doing to you today? Does it purify you? The Word of God prunes. It purifies all believers. So are you a believer? You see, it doesn't prune and purify unbelievers. It prunes and purifies believers. What's it doing to you? The Word of God isn't revealing grapes today. You know, I'm reading from John chapter 15. The Word of God's not revealing grapes today. The Word of God is revealing an eternal God that offers you eternal life today. This is not about the grapes I have in this bowl. Eternal life. The, the Word of God that is pruning, the Word of God that is purifying, is revealing eternal life. Eternal life. So let's do something really silly. How many of you would like eternal life in the kingdom of heaven? Raise your hand. Keep them up. Well, won't you raise them up real high like you're excited? Just pretend like you're excited. Who doesn't want this? Who doesn't want this? Everybody wants this, right? That's what we're talking about today. Not grapes. Eternal life in the kingdom of God. Who, who would turn this down? Come on. Come, who would turn this down? There's only one answer in all the universe. You don't believe it. You don't believe it. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, it says, For you have been born again. What happens when a branch gets connected to this vine in Israel? For you have been born again but not to a life that will quickly end. Your new life will last, how long, church? Forever. Why, 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 why? Why, why does this new life of being born again last forever? For Because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. It, it doesn't come from the dirt. It doesn't come because you made some sweet grapes. It comes, this pruning, this purification comes from something. What is it? The eternal, living Word of God. I'm holding it in my hand. Here we go. I believe what I hold in my hand is the only physical source of absolute truth on this planet. And I believe that this Word reveals not grapes. This Word reveals the vine and the gardener that own life. All of it. They own it. You can't get it somewhere else. You're not going to get it somewhere else. They invented life. They are life. Pruned and purified by the message of the Word. Yes, 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 yes. A new life that will last forever because it comes from the eternal living Word of God. A few minutes ago I asked all of you a question. Who wants eternal life? And everybody in the room held their hand up. So I'm going to ask you a, a practical application that leads to this sweet grape thing. Here we go. How much time this past week did you spend in this book? Now I'm going to tell you whether or not you're connected to the vine. How much time this last week were you in this book? No, preacher, I was planning on you doing that today, telling me what's in the book. You know, I do have a responsibility to tell you what's in the book. I can't connect you to this vine. I can't do it. It's not my job. My job is to tell you the message from the Word of God that the Holy Spirit gives me. How much time last week have you spent in this book? The power of God flowing through the Son of God into the lives of believers will always produce sweet grapes for the gardener. Is that it? Is that all? I'm going to put together the first four verses of 15. And is that it? Is that all? Uh-uh, no, no, we're just getting started. I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit. And He prunes the branches that do not bear fruit so they'll produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message. By the message uh, Jesus have given you. Verse 4, remain in me. What? Remain in me, and I'll remain in you. 
or a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. And you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Ten times in this chapter, Jesus uses the word remain. I wonder why. Because he knows who we are. He knows who we are. Ten times he used it in one chapter. The gardener has planted a grapevine in Israel, and he has offered us a place to connect to this life-giving, sweet, grape-producing vine. Connect to him. Remain connected to him, and you will produce sweet grapes for the gardener forever. In fact, you've heard me say over the years, connecting to this vine, you don't have to squeeze out sweet grapes. They will flow from you by his power. Just chill out. Just chill out. You know, people think sometimes, uh, sometimes Christians come, they connect to the, the vine, and it looks like they're contorted with their life, like they're in a strain all the time. Listen, ju just the grapevine is perfect. You connect to that grapevine, grapes are coming. Just relax. Just, just stay connected. I've often said, my job every day is this. Wake up, take a breath of air, thank God for that breath of air, and then make sure I'm connected to that vine. That's my job every day. Make sure I'm connected to that vine. How, how do you get connected to that vine? How do you remain in me? How do you abide in me? You want a method? I, go to this, I went to a church last Sunday and preached there. And everybody wants a method. We don't need a method. We need the Word. You want a six-step process? You don't need a six-step process. You need the Word. And you need to pray. That's it. Connect to Him. Remain connected to Him. And you will produce grapes. No one can produce sweet grapes apart from this true grapevine, never and forever. You can't do it. Do you want a fruitful, purposeful life? Oh, let's do it. I'm on a roll today. Why don't you raise your hand if you want a meaningful and purpose-filled life? Raise your hand. Now, how many? Now, put your hands down. How many of you would like to be losers? Raise your hand. I want a life that's absolutely meaningless and without purpose, preacher. Not a hand in the room. Why? Do you want to have a purpose-filled life? Abide in Him. Abide in Him. Connect your life to Jesus Christ. Stay connected. So what's the problem? Well, what's the problem, preacher? There's another gardener. What? There's another gardener. There's another choice. Jesus says, I'm the true grapevine, which alludes to the fact that there will be an imposter. If there's a true grapevine, there must be a false one. There's another remain. He says, remain in me. That means that there's another place you could remain. Another option. And guess what the bad news is? It is bad news. Our very nature leans away from God. Our very nature does not lean toward this great man. Mm -mm. No, 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 no. Our nature leans away from this great man to the imposter. If you don't believe me, just ask Israel. If you don't believe the nature, the heart of man leans away from this life-giving vine, Ask the northern kingdom of Israel. Ask the southern kingdom of Judah. Because they were connected to this life-giving vine and they became the most powerful nation in the world. And then they stopped abiding in the vine. And they thought they could do their own great thing. And God cut the vineyard down. The Jews in the time of Jesus still didn't get it. They thought they were entitled to be in the vineyard of God. Why? They had the law of Moses. They had the Old Testament law of Moses. They had the bloodline. My daddy's 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 daddy was in the wilderness with Moses. Don't talk to me, grapevine. 
He said they thought they were entitled. They thought they were entitled because of their own acts of righteousness. Listen to this encounter with Jesus. And I'm going to say, church people, we are not entitled to anything unless we are connected to this vine. In fact, let me give you the real truth. You don't want what you're entitled to outside this vine. You see, they thought they were entitled because of their bloodline, because of their history. John 8, verse 39. Our father is Abraham. They're looking at Jesus. Our father is Abraham, they declared. And Jesus said what? No. No. What do you mean, no? Our father's Abraham. We're connected to the life-giving vine. Abraham's the covenant. Our father's Abraham. Jesus said, no. No, he's not. You know what? He knows. No. For if you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. Instead, you're trying to kill me because I told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham never did such a thing. No. This is his second no. No. You are imitating your real father. Listen, church, there's another great man. And if you're not connected to Jesus' perfect mind, you are automatically by default connected to that other one. It's bad news. And Jesus said, no. 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 You're imitating your real father. Then they replied, you think they, oh, save us, Jesus. No, they're mad now. The truth has offended them. We are not illegitimate children. God himself is our true father. Jesus told them, if God were your father, you would love me. What's the test? Do you love him? Can I insert something? You want to know whether not, what you're connected to? Do you love this? Do you love this? Do you love this? Do you love the word? If God were your father, you'd love me because I have come to you from God. I'm not here on my own, but he sent me. Why can't you understand? Jesus looks at these people. He's pleading with them. Why can't you understand what I'm saying? It's because you can't even hear me. For you are children of your father, the devil. And you love to do, you love to do, you love to do the evil things that he puts in your hearts because you're connected to him. And you won't cut it off. You love to do the evil things that he does. He was a murderer from the beginning. Who do you think killed Adam and Eve? He has always hated the truth. Because there's no truth in him. And when he lies, it is consistent with his character, for he's a liar and he's the father of lies. So when I, Jesus, the true grapevine, when I tell you the truth, you just naturally don't believe me. Which of you can truthfully accuse me of sin? And since I'm telling you the truth, why don't you believe me? Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. Listen, what a powerful verse. Here it is. Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. Are you listening gladly today to this? But you don't listen because you don't belong to God. Are you connected to and abiding in Jesus? The Jews thought they could abide in God without abiding in Jesus. Do you think you can get to God without Jesus? You think you can go to heaven, have eternal life, and you don't need that grapevine thing? There are common threads between John 8 and John 15. There are two gardeners. There are two fathers. 
one's real, one's an imposter. Did you catch what will separate the two? Do you love the Word of God? Are you sure? John 8, 47. Here's the common thread. Let me read it to you. John 8, 47. Anyone who belongs to God listens gladly to the words of God. But you don't listen to these words. You don't listen to these words because you don't belong to God. Here's the first test. Do you love these words? Do you listen to these words? Do you put yourself under the authority of these words? I preached in Lexington last weekend, and I told the church in Lexington that every time I read this book, I am offended. It pierces my heart. But I don't look at the Word and say, Word, you need to adjust to me so that I not be offended. No, 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 no. I think that's the wrong approach. I adjust my life to this Word. I place it above me. And I submit my life to its authority. Why? Because I belong to God. I have connected my life to this grapevine. And now, you know what? Everybody today is offended by this. That's how He saves you. That's how He saves you. It does offend. It convicts. So that you might repent and find eternal life in this grapevine. John 15, 3, he said, Jesus said, you have already been pruned and purified. How? By the message. How'd you get pure, pruned? How'd you get purified? The message. Is it working? It will for some of you. I'm just not sure it'll work for everybody. It can. There's nothing wrong with this message, and there's nothing wrong with this grapevine. John 15, verse 7, but you remain in me. If you remain in me, and my words, and my words, and my words remain in you. You may ask for anything you want, and it'll be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I'm going to ask you again, do you love the Word? Don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to yourself. I told my kids growing up, the worst lie you'll ever give the worst lie you ever tell is when you tell a lie and then you believe it. Don't lie to yourself. Do you love this word? The answer to that is what you do with it. If it is the bread of your life that you don't want to go a day without eating this, without putting this inside of you, then you love this word. You've, you've gotten a taste for this. It's living water. It's the bread of life. It's a sweet grape. Ten times. Jesus says, remain in me and remain in my love. Ten times. Remain. Abide. Stay connected to this true grapevine. But how? Come on, Terry. Jesus is not here. I can't reach out today and touch him. So how? What have I been... What have I been reading to you for the last 30 minutes? What have I been reading? This book. The Word, the eternal living Word of God. How did you know about the gardener that I'm mentioned today? How did you know about the vineyard? How did you know about sweet grapes? How did you know about the other father and the lies? How did you know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? How did you know about a garden then and a garden now? How did you know? It's in this book. What did Israel let go of? Listen, here we go. Here's the summary. Here's the summary. What, did, what specifically did Israel let go of? God planted a vineyard in Israel. It began with a man named Abraham. It's a good vine. What did Israel let go of that caused the vine to be chopped down? The Word of God. What produced sweet grapes? Obedience to the Word of God. What's the church, the modern American church today, letting go of? The Word of God. This is not complicated. What do you need to hold on to? The Word of God. Abide in what? John 17, verse 1. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that He can give glory back to you. 
for you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life. One more time. Come on, one more time. Y'all need to exercise anyway. Raise your hand if you want eternal life. Read the screen. and Read it with me. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you, the only true God. So how are you going to know him? Now, next verse. And Jesus Christ, the one you sent to the earth. How are you going to know him? You see, to know God is eternal life. So how am I going to know God? Well, Jesus says, if you know me, you know the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. For I and the Father are one. Okay, you got me, Terry. So to know God, i got to know the Son. But he's not here right now. I can't touch him. I can't feel him. I can't experience him. So how are you going to know the Son? You know the Word. Is to know the Son. And to know the Son is to know the Father. And to know the Father is eternal life. You will never know the gardener until you know the true grapevine. And when I want to ask you this. How in the world can you know the true grapevine 2,000 years after he's left planet Earth? You know the answer. Everything you need to know. Everything you need to know. Everything you need to know about this grapevine to find eternal life is in this word. And the only thing that would keep you from receiving that is that you didn't believe that. I close with this. About 4,000 years ago, God planted a vineyard in Israel when he called a man named Abraham. That vineyard, planted by God himself, produced some sweet grapes and some sour grapes over the next 1,200 years. The first vineyard to fall was the northern kingdom of Israel. Then Judah fell and the grapes were scattered. God could have given up on the idea of a vineyard altogether. He could have said, this place just doesn't grow good grapes. But he didn't. Instead, he did this. He planted a perfect grapevine in Israel. This grapevine can only produce sweet grapes for the gardener. 2,000 years ago, God himself planted a, a new grapevine in Israel. It's perfect. It is impossible for this grapevine to produce sour and bitter grapes. This grapevine that produces sweet grapes for the gardener has a name, Jesus. All who connect to him and all who abide in him and all who remain in him will produce sweet grapes for the gardener forever. This grapevine can make sweet wine out of water. He proved it. But he chooses to make sweet wine out of you and me. I don't know how to make sweet wine for the gardener. So I've accepted the invitation from the true grapevine to connect and abide and remain in him. I've given my life over to him to bear fruit. One more question and then I'll offer a time of invitation today or branches to come and connect to the true grapevine. I'm going to read John 15, 3, and I'm going to ask all of you a personal question. Is this you? Yes or no? Verse 3. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Is that you? The word purifies. It prunes. Don't run from it, run to it. God planted a perfect vineyard in Israel 2,000 years ago to save your life. And I'm telling you the truth. There is a moving scene. Here's the last scene. I was reading it just last week. There's a moving scene on a beach as the Apostle Paul says farewell to the church at Ephesus. Paul is going to Jerusalem where he will spend most of the rest of his life in chains. And what were his closing words to these church people that he will never see on earth again? What did he say? What did he say? Because I'm going to tell you, this guy, Paul, was connected to that vine. He bore a lot of fruit. What did he say? 
He's not going to ever see them on earth again. He knows it. The Holy Spirit's leading him to Jerusalem. He's going to be, most of his life, well, he'll be a prisoner until they cut his head off. Acts chapter 20, verse 25. And now I know that none of you to whom I have preached the kingdom will ever see me again. And I declare to you that I have been faithful. If anyone suffers eternal death, Paul said, it's not my fault. Did you hear that? I was moved. Paul looks at these church people that he will never see on earth again. He says, if any of you suffer eternal death, it's not my fault. Why? Why? How can he say that? Look at the next verse. For I didn't shrink from declaring all that God wants you to know. Eternal death is when the Father cuts off the unfruitful branches and He throws them into the fire. God planted a perfect grapevine in Israel 2,000 years ago to save your life. And to know Him is eternal life. I'll ask Chad to come out for the invitation today. I, this last week, I was, I have XM radio in my car, and I heard an advertisement that Billy Graham's preaching nonstop on channel 145 on Sirius XM. So I turned over, and I've spent all week, every time I've been in the car, I've been listening. And I've been amazed, I've been amazed, because you know what, I, I, I hadn't heard his sermons for a long time, and I've listened to a bunch of them this week, because I've been in the car a lot. You know what, if I could tell you what his sermons are. This man who preached probably to more people than any man has ever lived on earth. Repent. Jesus is coming. I was amazed. I didn't expect that. Repent. 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 Turn from your sins. Repent and receive Christ. Turn from your sins for the day the Lord is drawing near. You know, we don't even have a new message. Billy Graham's 99 years old. We don't even have a new message. We got the same message. The same, he's doing the same thing I'm doing. And if Lord tarries, there will be another one. Follow me and he'll do the same thing. What? 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 2,000 years ago, God planted a perfect vine in Israel. And anybody who will come over and connect their life to that vine will live forever. But to connect to that vine, you will have to turn from your sin. You got to repent. You got to turn, take hold of that. He'll take hold of you. He'll purify you. He'll prune you. Your life will bear fruit. There'll be purpose and meaning. Or, or there's another option. Remain disconnected and you will walk headlong into your death. But I'm going to join the Apostle Paul and say it's not my fault. Because I told you. I told you. The Word told you. The Holy Spirit told you. This church told you. The invitation's open. Let's stand.
Would you pray with me? You're the anchor of our soul. You defend us. Father, we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to those who are being saved. We will not be ashamed of this word. We will not be ashamed of life or the life giver or the vine or the gardener, for we are only branches connected to the life-giving vine who came to save our life. So today I pray for your church. I pray for your church here, Nineveh, and I pray for your church around the world that you would awaken us from our slumber. And Father, we would take hold of this vine and connect ourselves to this life-giving vine and allow your life, your light, your word, your message, your hope, your salvation to flow through the church into the world that does not know you. And when you return, may you find your bride ready. Oil in her lamps, light in our lives, sweet grapes on the branches, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.